Once upon a time in my eighth grade compact math class, my teacher taught us about the Fibonacci sequence. In a nutshell, the Fibonacci sequence is a series of numbers in which each number is the sum of the two preceding numbers. For example, the simplest series is 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21, and so on. What's even more interesting is that how if you take a number in the Fibonacci sequence and divide it by the previous number, the quotient becomes closer and closer to a single value, 1.618. For example, 5 divided by 13 equals 1.667, 13 divided by 8 equals 1.625, and if you were to continue on with this series, 144 divided by 89 equals 1.617. This is certainly not a coincidence. This value of 1.618 is defined as phi in mathematics and is better known as the golden ratio. Geometrically, the golden ratio looks like this, with each side of a rectangle being a number in the Fibonacci sequence. So I know many of you may be having horrific flashbacks to math class, asking yourself, when am I ever going to use this in real life? But you may be surprised how significant this value truly is. For instance, I'm sure most of you have seen the Mona Lisa painted by Leonardo da Vinci, or the great wave of Kanagawa created by Hokusai. Well, as you can see, the golden ratio is seen in, in fact, both, both of these classic works of art. This lecture puzzled eighth grade me. I wondered who knew math and art, topics from two completely different studies, could be so related that they are each parts of a whole. This is a question I still ponder today, but now I apply it to the relationship between the overall studies of humanities and STEM. Essentially, humanities studies include, but are not limited to, history, literature, philosophy, and the arts. On the other hand, STEM stands for science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. So as you can see, two completely different studies, with the former being subjective and based on personal interpretation, while the latter being objective based on facts, statistics, observations, and evidence. Oftentimes, it is this difference that causes a clash between the two realms. Take the famous nature versus nurture debate, for example. Many people question whether our personalities and our characteristics as human beings is, are contributed to our unique genetic code or to the culture that we are raised in. There may never be correct answers to such questions, but I believe that there is one way to unite the two opposing worlds, medicine. Medicine demonstrates how you cannot have the humanities without STEM and vice versa. In fact, at Johns Hopkins University, there is a, a major that is called Medicine, Science, and the Humanities. If you really think about it, healthcare providers use biology, chemistry, anatomy, and all different branches of science to treat humanity. Medical students not only learn anatomy and physiology during medical school, but also how to deal with patients during the residency. Essentially, they are learning about the human body and the human being they are treating. All good doctors have the same fundamental knowledge on how to treat a disease, but all great doctors know how to treat a patient. And I believe that it is not entirely the MD diploma hanging on the walls of our doctor's office that allows patients to fully trust their healthcare providers, but it is even though this certainly helps establish their credibility. But it is also the human and personal quality that all great doctors maintain that allows a patient to put their full trust into the hands of their physicians. Doctors epitomize the human in humanities while also having the science knowledge in STEM, acting as a bridge between the two worlds. Furthermore, Global public health experts must use more than what is in the STEM world to tackle public health crises. In order to fully understand pandemics like HIV and AIDS or epidemics like Ebola and the avian influenza, one must consider the political implications, the socioeconomic disparities, the cultural limitations, and the environmental hazards that could potentially influence the spread of disease throughout the world. Let us analyze the sexual and reproductive health of women in lesser developed countries, for example. 
This is a topic that the World Health Organization has been fighting to improve for many years. According to the World Health Organization, 214 million women of reproductive age in lesser developed countries do not have access or do not use modern contraceptive methods. And the World Health Organization cannot simply supply these women with the contraceptives that they need. Why? Well, there are other factors such as the culture the women live in, their, the women's economic status, and the legislation in place that make this discussion more complex. Take the Philippines, for instance. The Philippines is the largest Roman Catholic country in Asia, and therefore, many conservative lawmakers certainly condemn the use of contraception. Additionally, many women in the Philippines are not able to afford purchasing the various contraceptive methods. According to the Human Rights Watch, in 2015, 51 female hormonal contraceptives were banned in the Philippines. Fortunately, a, re a reproductive health bill was passed that required not only the national distribution of contraceptives, but as well as the a comprehensive educa sexual education in schools and a more efficient system of decreasing the incidence of maternal deaths in the Philippines. Clearly, the topic of women's reproductive health in least lesser developed countries is not strictly medical or strictly scientific. And oftentimes, it is not the biology or the chemistry that inhibits the success of medicine but it is the economic, political, and cultural boundaries that make implementation more difficult. So why does this matter? Well, you see, it is important as human beings that we do not limit ourselves to view the world through one lens or perspective. Using the humanities, we are able to see the beauty of the, of the evidence that we discover through science and mathematics, the beauty of medicine and global public health is that we are able to see the significance in the relationship between the humanities and STEM. As stated in the World Health Organization Constitution, the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of health is one of the basic fundamental human rights of every human being, no matter distinction of race, religion, political belief, economic, or social condition. Over the summer, I went to a medical conference in Boston where I heard phenomenal speakers, Nobel Prize laureates, and award-winning award medical researchers who discussed their achievements and their journey through the medical field. One of my favorite speakers was Jack Andraka, who was the Intel International Science and Engineering Fair winner in 2012. He said that the work as physicians, as healthcare workers, and as medical researchers can't end at the doors of the clinic. The responsibility to the patient does not end at diagnosing and treating diseases within the walls of the hospital. It also means treating social diseases like misogyny, racism, homophobia, and standing up for every human being, no matter their citizenship, income, or identity. Because it is this, it is all of these factors that affect a patient's health. The Hippocratic Oath demands this change. And as a member of the next generation of physicians, hopefully, I wish to begin making this change. Because doctors are not just scientists. They are activists who advocate that health is a basic fundamental right, not a privilege. So, I guess you could say math did come in handy because without that class in eighth grade, I would, to spur my curiosity, I would not be on the stage describing my love and appreciation for the medical field. And as a result, today, I would not define myself as fully a scientist or fully a romanticist because I know that the butterflies in my stomach right now don't actually exist because they would never survive the acidic pH. <laughs> but they are a friendly reminder that I am human. Thank you. <laughs>